Our guest speaker today is the executive chairman of Metals Exploration PLC. He is also the president of FCF Minerals Corporation and project director for what he will talk about today, the Run Rano Gold and Molybdenum Project in Northern Luzon. For those of you who do not know what molybdenum is, we'll ask our speaker to tell us. It has something to do with the steel industry, doesn't it? Some said it's the Viagra of the steel industry. It's what hardens the steel. He has over 37 years experience in the mining industry and encompasses a wide range of management, operational, mine development, and feasibility study roles. He was managing director of Highlands Pacific Limited from 1997 to 2007, where he implemented the feasibility study on the Ramu Nickel Laterite project in Papua New Guinea, and subsequent sale of a majority interest in the project to a major Chinese corporation. He was also responsible for the feasibility, study, development, financing, construction, and commissioning of the Kainantu Gold Mine also in PNG, and the management of a pre-feasibility -feasib study on the Frida River Porphyry Copper and Gold Deposit also in Papua New Guinea. He has extensive experience in the implementation of major project feasibility studies, equity raising, investor relations, debt financing, working with traditional societies, government negotiations, and all pa aspects of project development. He's a member of the Australasian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy and the Australian Institute of Geoscientists. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome the gentleman who will speak to us on the topic called Run Rano Today and the Future, Ian Holzberger. Well, uh, thanks very much, Leah, for the uh, uh, glowing introduction. I guess I need to disappoint you first up. Um, Molly isn't the Viagra of the steel industry. It's actually an elasticizer, so it has exactly the opposite effect. <laughs> and uh, it tends to be used in line pipe. So it's actually used extensively in um, hydrocarbon line pipe to make it more elastic and, and more flexible in in kind of earthquakes and various other disaster type situations. Outside of that, everyone would know Molly's in Greece. It's the black crap that gets all over you when, you, when you're playing. So it's a very common use. Um, thanks to, to Kevin for uh, creating the mining club and for the opportunity to stand up here in front of you. When he first asked me, I was pretty, pretty hopeful I could give you a discussion on the kind of rigging geometry of rowing boats on the Pasig. But uh, there's a kind of topic that I reckon I could kind of tell a story on and get away with. But he's been pretty insistent that I talk about uh, Ramu. So that's the topic. I'm going to have to be on my mettle. I'd say about 25% of the people in the room here have, uh, have worked on the project and probably know as much about it as I do in one way or another. So uh, it's good to be amongst peers. Let's see if we can get a, a coherent story. As a number of you be uh, aware, uh, Run Rano has been around for a while. It's uh, like most good... Uh, projects in the world has had a bit of a checkered history. It's been through three or four different companies. It was finally picked up by the, the Metals Exploration Group uh, under Gary Powell and Peter Draper back in about 2005, Gary. It's about right. Um, and I guess we really hit the ground in 2006. I'd like to think of it as being a fairly greenfields project at that stage. There was a bit of limited work in one end of it. But since that time, we've taken the project forward to the point that we've now completed a feasibility study. I guess I should get through this. This is what I call my get out of jail free card. It literally says that I'm doing my best to tell the truth, but if I inadvertently say something that's wrong, it's not my fault. So, <laughs> seeing you've all read it, I'll move on. Okay, we, um, I guess we're one of the kind of newer generations, for want of a better word, in that we took the uh, FTAA, Financial Technical Assistance Agreement, route. Uh, we plan to be 100% uh, offshore owned in the project. We secured that in 2009. It was about a 12 to 15 month process. Um, status, um, as I indicated, the uh, work really started seriously in 2006. Since that time, we've taken it through a scoping study, a pre feasibility study, and uh, published our feasibility study in May 2010. We like to describe the project as development ready, 
It's like most projects, we're constantly running around plastering over the cracks that we know that are there, we're repairing them, we're doing continuous enhancement. The, uh, the project that we'll look at today is an improvement on the, that that we produced in the study in 2010. As it stands today, or oh, sorry, I should, should say some time back we, we took a view that we could continue spending shareholders' funds uh, by exploring or we could uh, try and realise the asset that we had in the ground and then from that grow the project. So we, um, we ended up with about 1.5 million ounces in resources. We've uh, wrapped a pit around that at the moment. We have about a million ounces in the pit. Gives us an operation of about 10.3 years life. We'd like to think very much of that being our starter project and we'd be looking forward to that to, to grow both in, in annual production and ultimate life. The, um, the production shown there is around 100,000 ounces a year, slightly higher in the, in the initial years and uh, a bit lower in the later years, as all good mines are. Um, it allows you to catch up later on. CapEx, and I stress that this is, uh, is mid-2010's CapEx. Uh, it is being refreshed now, but about $150 million. Operating costs are under 500, which looks pretty good when we're talking about uh, $1,500 gold price. I hope it stays there. Considerable upside, as I indicated, both to extend the operation but also to uh, produce some co-product uh, molybdenum. And we're very much working on the molly. We see that coming in later in the project, probably at the end of year one or into year, um, you know, kind of one and a half type of thing. And it has the potential to produce about a million pounds of uh, molly as a co-product. Additional cash flow of about $15 million a year. Got a lot of things going for it. The project, it's, uh, it's located, most, sorry, I should start before that. Most projects I've worked on in the past are sit on geopolitical boundaries. Uh, and, uh, and that's the worst place in the world to sit. This one sits in one barangay, in one municipal and one province. It's made life that much easier and uh, certainly the, the earlier workers on that took that advantage and uh, really locked us in with our kind of social corporate responsibility working in the area and it's been great to come along after that and to pick up with it. Access, today you can drive to it, <coughs> you always have been able to, <coughs> it's about 320 kilometres from, uh, from Manila, uh, that translates into somewhere between six and nine hours, depends on the weather and the roads and all the rest of it. Something is pretty familiar. But um, we, we exclusively drive to, it, drive to it, we don't fly. Um, one of the, I, was, um, I first looked at the project myself uh, as a bit of a favour for a mate, and unfortunately he's moved on and I'm still here, so it must have been really pretty good. But I looked at it in uh, late 2007, 2008, and uh, I can remember walking out there and walking up the top of the hill with Gary, who's sitting over here, tailings the implant sites and all the rest of it. This is actually all there in front of us. Um, it's remarkable. And I keep saying, you know, there's got to be a crack here somewhere. We've got to find it. We haven't as far as infrastructure and logistics are concerned. So it's 27 kilometres by road uh, from the, uh, the town or the joint town. It's probably a better description of Bambong and Solano. Um, about half of that's um, cemented or sealed uh, concrete at this stage, uh, then continuing to increase the concrete. It's creeping towards the site every, every week. Um, the balance is, is well-formed national road. Um, it's poorly maintained, as, as you'd expect. So for us, it's a matter of upgrading the road a little uh, in a few areas and then maintaining it going forward. As, as we stand here today, um, there is a power line running to, right to the site. Um, I might say you can see the electrons fall out the end of it. It's not exactly high quality and we have to do something about it. But the, the news is good for us in that we can actually use that easement, upgrade the, uh, the power and tap into the national grid. Um, i trying to point out that's the national grid running down past the project. Um, 320 kVA straight off Magat. Plenty of power, 360 uh, megs at Magat. They're producing about 270 at the moment. And sitting at Bang Bong with a, with a bay for us is an anti-island switchyard. So if you started to design things, you started with a checklist, many of them are there. And uh, also a, um, an all-weather airfield at Bagger Bay. I was interested earlier to hear Leo saying that um, you know, part of his strategy is to bring well-experienced uh, Filipinos back uh, to work in the industry here. And that's also very much part of our strategy. We're aligned with that. And we would hope to, to use the kind of well-serviced uh, Solano Bambong 
township as a base for uh, Filipino uh, middle and senior management uh, placed there with their families and uh, effectively travelling to work yeah, each day. So a lot going for it. Um, these have been, these are calls on our website. I'm not going to go through them in, in great detail, but basically we have about 1.5 million ounces in resource. We have um, two thirds of that in reserves, a bit over two thirds of it in, in the pit. These are all being done by external experts, same people that, that Crazy Horse and others use here, so well known to the Philippines and to the industry. That's based on, um, yeah, there's about nearly 120,000 120, metres, 120 kilometres of drilling in there in, in near a thousand holes today. Moving on to project, and I apologise for the, the, the quality of this. It hasn't transported out of the feasibility study very well, but basically it's, it's divided up into five key aspects, and you'll see how this comes later for our execution strategy. But we have the, the mine, the open pit, which basically... It's very difficult to see on this, but it's sitting in the in the area in there, it sits on the side of the hill. Uh, ultimately, most of the pit will be above the river level. You can see the Solano River running through. Uh, sorry, the Sulong River running through the project. Processing plant is divided into two components: one on the east side or the mine side of the river, which is the crusher, connected by conveyor to the balance of the plant on the west side of the river. Tailing storage facility will be a valley fill. Uh, facility, you can see it down there in the bottom of the slide, the big orange blob. Um, other site infrastructure, so all of our offices and camps and various other bits, and our off-site infrastructure, the road and the power line that I referred to earlier. It's got a reasonably modest footprint for a mine of about 420 hectares. Moving on to the pit, basically conventional truck and shovel operation. A lot of it we see will be free digging, some of it will be obviously drill and blast. Um, for us, um, the rock is very broken, it's quite soft. This is what uh, we call silica undersaturated rock. There is no quartz in this thing. It is quite, quite friable and will break up. That's the, the good part. That usually comes with uh, some pretty terrible ground conditions, but the other good part is it dips very flatly through the project, so it doesn't have natural planes of weakness and it's quite stable in its natural position. Looking to mine about 1.75 million tonnes a year uh, of ore, that will give us our 100,000 ounces, and for that we have a strip ratio of about 5.2 to 1. So total, total earth movements uh, sitting in here are around 11 million tonnes per year. Um, we're looking at a, a, a pretty a neat strategy, I think, the, um, some pre-strip and uh, the first three years of mining will be used to build a tailings dam wall. Once we've created that hole, we'll be tipping uh, waste back into the pit, so we've got very short hauls and we become very efficient with our, with our fleet. And so we see it today as using about seven trucks and, and two excavators as a fleet. So very, very neat and tidy, also with a reasonably elegant environmental solution for us. Um, just try, try some technology here, we'll go with it. Just trying to have a look at uh, the stages of the mine. These are in uh, two-year tranches, but we basically undertake a pre-strip. We've created a ROM pad. Pre-strip, the material that's been dug out of here, creates the starter wall for the tailings dam. Um, moving out to year three, you can see we've actually dug a pit. This is the only part of the pit that, that goes below the, the uh, Sulong River. All of that material has actually gone into the tailings dam wall to create its ultimate height. From then on, we part taking our, start taking our waste and putting it back into the mined out pit. While this is pretty schematic, bear with me, it won't be that smooth, but, but it demonstrates it fairly, fairly clearly as we step through the mine, rehabilitate the mine back to ultimately rehabilitation. Hopefully that doesn't occur. I don't want to see that in year 11 because I want this thing to be going for another 10 or 15 years. But that's, that's what our, our final mine uh, rehabilitation plan says today. A processing plant, the, it's not conventional. There is not another one of these in, in the Philippines. We do have a refractory ore, or certainly partial refractory. Um, about 50, 55% of our gold is free, and we can actually uh, recover it using gravity techniques, although in a process plant it'll be less than that. It'll probably be about 30. The balance of it is refractory or double refractory. It's very hard to get, so we have to go through an oxidation uh, circuit to achieve that. 
We've looked at all the conventional circuits, the uh, autoclaves, roasters, uh, and whatever. I guess the cut, cuts to the chase, they're too capital intensive for a project of this size. They're too difficult to operate for a start-up operation. And so we've selected uh, Biox. We've selected it for good commercial and operation reasons and also because we get excellent recoveries. Uh, we undertook about a 20-tonne 20, 20 pilot plant uh, in South Africa to demonstrate the application of the Biox technology. Biox, as it implies, is based on little bugs chewing up the sulphur. They love the sulphur, they love air. So we put them in a tank, we keep them, keep them nicely comfortable at about 42 degrees. We put huge, humongous volumes of air into the tank. Um, and as long as we do those things, these things will, will eat sulphur to completion. And uh, we're seeing recoveries in excess of 90, 95% using this process. So it's, it's, it's very, very good for us. There's about 13 or 14 of these plants operating elsewhere in the world at the moment. After, um, after the, um, the biox, and we use conventional carbon and leach technology to recover the gold. We mentioned earlier molybdenum. Molybdenum is a bit of an enigma for us. There certainly is, um, there is a lot of molybdenum in, in the project. It's very fine grain. It's not responsive to con conventional flotation technology for recovery. But what we do find is once we go through the, the biox plant, it's a very acidic environment. Uh, a lot of the molybdenum actually goes into solution, so we've actually got it dissolved in liquor. And where we're working at the moment uh, with a group in Australia is in a novel recovery plant. There isn't, a, there isn't a precedent for this out there. It's a novel recovery plant to recover that mol molybdenum into a saleable product. That's the very reason that it won't be installed at day one. It's, it's going to be a, you know, a risk and demonstrated circuit. So we will need to get the gold circuit up, have it running, get it stable, and, uh, and also, once we've done that, we can put a demonstration plant in and then retrofit the molybdenum plant. When I explain it to the board, I guess I do it this way, I say fundamentally today as we sit here, there's uh, $150 million worth of revenue from gold and there's $15 million worth of revenue for molly. Do you want me to screw up the gold to, to get the molly? I don't think so. So it's a very easy decision. We're very bullish that we will actually get that on um, within you know, a year and a half, or year, year to two, and it will add nicely to the project. Um, for those uh, slightly technical guys in amongst the group, a process flow diagram, I'll just go through it very quickly. Um, the ore is very soft. We don't use a crusher. We use a bit of equipment that we call a sizer, which is just designed to break it up. So it's, um, it's a low energy, low abrasion in through a single sag mill. The first step in the biox, so we've got 1.75 million tonnes going through there. The first step in a biox circuit is to actually to reject as much mass as you can. So we go through a very simple rougher flotation stage where we uh, recover about 7% of the material into a concentrate. So we're recovering about 120, 130,000 tonnes a year into a concentrate. The rest goes straight out to the tailings dam basically hasn't seen any chemicals except for a little bit of packs in the, in the flotation circuit. From that stage, the 130 tonnes or so goes into the, uh, the biox circuit. Biox circuit comprises eight big tanks, a lot of air, a lot of agitation, uh, and about four days in there, and the bugs do their, their magic. Comes out the back end, uh, some liquid solid separation. Sorry, the biox is... is mm. Biox circuit is here, liquid solid separation, so we separate the liquor from the, from the solids. The liquor does have the dissolved moly in it, so when we, we look to put a moly circuit, we'll take that through to a moly recovery step. The solids have the gold, we take the gold into a conventional CIL through cyanide destruct and then dispose to the tailings dam. This ain't quick, it's very easy. In reality, there's a lot of pipes and a lot of tanks in this circuit. Tailing storage facility, just very quickly, we've, um, we've worked very hard to have a single point discharge on the project, which will be out of the tailing storage facility. Um, we're looking to use a valley fill model, so effectively a blind valley with a, with a wall in it. This is a photograph of um, actually the first tailings dam ever successfully built in Papua New Guinea. And uh, Craig Watkins, our country manager, and I built this for, as part of the Kainantu project. It's this style of dam. It's, it's not identical to this. The, uh, the valley's narrower, the wall will be a bit higher, 
but it's the principle that we'll be using. As I indicated, during uh, construction, we'll do some pre-strip, build a two-year starter embankment into the wall. We'll continuously lift that over the next three years out of our mining operation. And at that point, the, mine, the um, dam will be its ultimate height. The tailings uh, go through cyanide destruct, and then will be uh, deposited subaqueously, so below the surface water, uh, into the dam. All of our process water, everything bar effectively uh, potable, and some special water supply will actually be recovered back out of the dam. So we're recycling the water, not going to the local rivers once we're in steady state operations to, uh, to use water top up for the circuit. Um, I guess this is just hammering the point a bit. It's, um, for those who want to see it, this will be up on the website later. You can look at it at your leisure, but it shows you our water balance around the project. Off-strike infrastructure, I mentioned it earlier, we've got an access road. We've got to upgrade about three kilometres of that. The rest of it is really just uh, resurfacing it and, uh, and our power supply. We've, uh, we've applied for Direct Connect. Uh, we'll be looking to, to purchase from the IPP. We do have the support of Novel, uh, Novelco, which is a local distribution agent. Uh, we've done a deal with them where we can actually restand their current lines with new 60, 69 kV lines up their easement. Uh, it's about uh, 36 kilometres from the switchyard and uh, we'll swing the current community supply underneath that on the same poles, which clearly, clearly means their facilities will be upgraded and we'll have some more security of supply with uh, people who are unlikely to chop down poles that supply their own TVs and freezers and refrigerators and various other bits and pieces. We'll be um, steady state drawing about 13 megawatts in estimate. We'll have about half of that as backup generation at site. Major reason for that is a power outage. We have to keep the bugs happy and that's uh, maintaining temperature, circulating loads and keeping some blowers and other things going. Currently at site, um, we're in, a, we're in a kind of transitory phase. We're between uh, kind of full-on in a feasibility study and then upgrading our reserves within our pit to a, to a pre-construction phase. And so our major activities are listed here. Basically, we've restarted our exploration program. We do plan to find some more. We've made commitments um, to our shareholders and, and also to the government that we will look for more ore. And that program has just started recently, about three or four months ago. Um, land acquisition is always key. We currently have about 75-80% of it unacquired. The rest of it is actually coming in at a, at a fairly rewarding rate at the moment. We're, um, the message is out that this thing's going to get built and um, we're having some good success in closing out the final, the final land acquisition that we need. Small scale miners, of course we have them. It's a gold, gold project. Um, there are probably about 400 of them working here. Um, we need to manage that very carefully but our plan there would be to actually uh, use those guys in, in the operations and in the, in the construction. So move them aside on that basis. Just quickly look at it. Uh, this slide's been around for some time. Once again, I referred to Gary a couple of times. I can thank Gary for this. He was the guy that was sitting half asleep in the back of a conference one day, listening to a guy called Carl Jensen, and he, he mumbled something about a you know, silica undersaturated alkaline complex, and Gary kind of woke up out of his slumber and said, we got one of them. As it turns out, it is. It is. Uh, Jensen's been out. He's, uh, he's had a good look at it, and he certainly endorses it. They're very rare beasts. There's, there's one well-known one, which is Cripple Creek in, in the States, um, and there are a few other others that are alluded to by in hushed tones that people as being the next big exploration model. We'll see. Um, purpose of this slide is to say, hey, we've got one up here now. It Cripple Creek's mine 23 million. Um, join the dots. I'm not pretending that we're going to get 23 million ounces, but, but the message to take out of this slide is the upside potential is, is, is quite strong. There's one difference between us and Cripple Creek, is Cripple Creek is in, in old terrain. It's been extensively eroded, so a lot of the potential has been removed, whereas at uh, Run Runno, this is still a pretty, pretty virgin type of project. There hasn't been a lot of erosion, so we've got a fairly complete system. Hopefully... Um, We'll get to understand it better as we go go ahead. Just the hammer the uh, hammer the point. This is some ground uh, geochem. You can see it rings a complex. Um, the, the red spots are the hot spots. It's incomplete. We're completing it now. 
Um, but we've certainly got um, a good book of targets to follow. And at the moment we have two diamond drill rigs committed to this type of exploration, first pass exploration, with five or six projects that we're, we're going to follow up quite vigorously over the balance of this year. I should also say there is potential for copper mineralisation within the area. These things aren't exclusively gold and molybdenum, but uh, they could have a porphyry type system associated with them, yet to be found. Um, I guess the rest of these, these are a bit of a bit of an advertorial for what we do and what we do very well. Um, I made a comment that the original um, promoters of the company set our, um, our kind of community relations and environment up very, very well. And that stood us in very, very good stead because it's allowed us to move through the permitting system with comparative ease. Um, so, you know, all power to the guys. Today we work very hard on environment, like any of our peers. I'm not, not trying to single ourselves us out as being anything particular. Any responsible mining company operating in the, in the country will, will do this and will do it just as well as we do. But these are the key issues. Put up this uh, stopes labelisation and, and uh, rehab. It's an interesting point. You know, mining's all, and especially with the, with the kind of rhetoric that's going on in the press and whatever at the moment, mining's always blamed for everything. There's actually a demonstration out here where the hill that we've worked on, where we've drilled uh, nearly a 1,000 holes, so there's probably, I don't know, pick a number, 600 drill pads. You go out there today in the rain, you won't see one slip. It's been rehabilitated with the help of uh, a Macca Ferry and some design from them and our pretty committed environment group. We see no slips. You go either side of the project, the road in, there are slips all over the place. So it demonstrates to me that with a little bit of, with a little bit of um, forethought and a bit of commitment, you can actually stabilise these things and actually turn them into a, a better environment. Very big success story for us. All good projects, we keep a good eye on the environment. We're creating baseline data and so on for all of our, our future operations because clearly there will be a lot of rhetoric around about a mining operation. Um, I'll just flip through these very quickly. They're all the normal kind of arsenal of things that you do in a mine to do it properly. Mining forest program, it's been in the news a lot lately. MGB's asking people to commit to it. Hey, we've been doing it for five years. Um, and so it's nothing new. It's been very, very successful. We engage the community and, and students in it. And uh, we've planned it out 43 hectares to, to date, and we've won a number of awards for our, our uh, efforts there. Safety and health. Um, I know I was, our staff's wandering around with a million accident-free hours or something on their shirt. I think we're now at about 1.6 million. So we, we've got pretty good statistics. Um, I think um, Zaldi probably knows them better than I do. He's sitting over next to Gary. But uh, it's been a very, very long time since we've had a lost time incident on site. Obviously, if we don't have the social licence to operate, we're not going to operate. It doesn't matter what central government says. If the people and the, and the provincial authorities don't want us there, it makes life too difficult. So we have a very large effort of communicating and talking and uh, educating, and uh, that's a large, a large part of what we're doing on site today. And once again, I've just got a, a mugs, mugs gallery here of things that we've done at site. But basically, we're looking for sustainable industry, we're looking at education, we're looking at health, we're looking at um, out of view, out of em, sorry, out of employed youth, unemployed youth. Uh, malnutrition, uh, higher productivity out of, uh, out of farming, and just straight infrastructure development. All the, all the normal arsenal of, um, of things that you would expect a responsible company to do. Okay, complete the advertorial. I guess the reason we're here is what, where are we going from, from here? Um, this is just a simplified corporate structure. Uh, I've only put it here. I'm talking as Metals Exploration, FCF, Metals X is the listed entity. It's listed on the AIM in the London Stock Exchange. Today we own 85% of FCF minerals, the balance being owned by Christian Mining, but we do have an open-ended option to take that out and we can move to 100%. Um, I guess um, there's some good and bad news in this. Over the last year we've had a fairly difficult time 
as far as uh, operational management is concerned, is we've had a, a um, what would be the best word, a vigorously defended takeover or vigorously fought takeover offer. It's almost uh, locked the company up for 12 months. Um, fortunately, that's been resolved. Uh, the resolution was put in place in um, April. Uh, it's been resolved very positively. It leaves us with a very clear capital structure. Um, basically, there's 80-odd 80, 80 percent of the company sits in, in four major shareholders' hands. It's left us with a considerable amount of money in the bank, and it's also left us with a significant tranche of short-dated options sitting out there, which, um, which um, mature in um, August, and uh, with the expectation that the vast majority of those will be exercised, we will basically be funded for our equity share of a development. Nice place to be from, from someone who was on, I use because I use the words very carefully, limp home mode last year. Uh, we were running things very tightly. I mean, and but to give full credit to the local operators, they achieved an enormous amount in upgrading our reserves and getting permitting done. So there was a lot done under the radar. But now we're, we're poised to take this, this project forward. So uh, to pick up on Sandy, you showed you lots of lovely graphs there. Well, we're at 10 years ago now. So we've got the growth from 10 years as we ride the development curve here. So it's all up for us. Um, how are we going to do it? We're in the process today of building up our owners' teams. You start to see a, a few more people wandering around the place handing out FCF uh, cards. It's a mix of expatriates and Filipinos. Once again, Leo, perhaps you can help us bring some good blokes back because we're certainly looking for them. Um, our intention is to um, place the, the process plant uh, under a, um, an EPC type execution strategy with a, um, I guess an engineer constructor who's got a dem demonstrated performance, fill the dotted lines in. That's about $100 million, $110 million, probably about uh, two thirds of our, of our capital will sit inside that major contract. We are certainly quite advanced um, with Leighton in talking about that, and uh, hopefully we can take that to some kind of finality over the next uh, month or two. Yeah, Chris, you didn't fall off your chair. I told you I'd be nice to you today for a change. Um, Outside of that, the rest of the infrastructure we're going to look to uh, develop in, in a series of packages, uh, I guess uh, overseen by our own people, but uh, executed by either design and construct or local engineer or local um, subcontractors. Sub the, um, as we stand here today, the pre-strip on the mine and the um, tailing storage facility, we'd look to self-execute that. We do have the guy in house now that is capable of running the mining fleet for us and just added another one today. So we're, we're actually getting our people on the ground and we would do that with our mining fleet. So we bring our mining fleet in early, operate for about 11 or 12 months and build that tailings dam. Um, we're supplementing our own people with a number of very experienced um, consultants in, in various areas, especially around the biox area and uh, the metallurgical circuit. Wherever possible, subject to skill and price, we'll actually use local contractors. We'd like to see as much of the benefit remain in the, in the province as we can possibly achieve. How long and when? How long's a bit of string? I'm sick of guessing, to be frank. But uh, we've achieved a lot, and I uh, made, the, made the comment that the local management is, is actually miraculous uh, in what they've achieved, and I certainly um, take my hat off to them. We're effectively, all bar the actual ink on the page, uh, completed our declaration for mining feasibility. It's a monumental step. This will be the second only declaration under an FTA 8, the first being the, the DPO. Uh, and so there's a fair bit of trailblazing being done in that. So between our, our Filipino staff and Craig Watkins, they've done an absolute magnificent job to get there. Um, just to... Uh, give you a bit of a shopping list of things that, that, that we needed to do in here. This is basically our permitting list. And uh, there's lots of things here, but this includes our environmental protection enhancements programs, our uh, rehabilitation programs, um, social development management programs. There's more programs and more acronyms in the Philippines than anywhere else I've ever worked in my life. 
but uh, we just sat down with our head down, our backside up and, and got through them. One of the things we're particularly proud of and I think speaks, speaks very highly of this, I keep calling it this kind of social uh, licence to operate, is that we got an endorsement of three levels of local government for the project, so Barangay, Municipal and Province. I think that's probably almost unheard of yeah, in here. I'm not saying that we're not with, without detractors. Of course, we're with these detractors. That's, that's life. But the, the uh, acceptance of the uh, project is very, very high. Um, where's, the, um, where's the DMF at the moment? It's basically sitting on the director's desk. So uh, how long is it going to take? Were we going to run a lottery or a guessing game later on? I'm, I'm quite happy. Ten bucks a throw, guys, and you can all have a, go, a date on when we're going to get it. What do we want to do? I've divided this into two sections. I'm calling it sanction and pre-sanction. Sanction means that we have our full funding package in place and uh, we start construction of the processing plant. Pre-sanction means the work that we need to do to get there. So we're looking at pad preparation, road construction, uh, probably some uh, some detailed engineering on the plant and whatever. We're at a position where today, if we had the DMF, within a month we could actually start those pre-sanctioned works, and that would be our desire. So I'm suggesting that we would uh, commence pre-sanctioned in Q3. Financing is is kind of well advanced, and um, I think that'll be Q3, Q4, and uh, sanction around the same boundary, Q3, Q4. If we do that. Um, we could see production in Q2 2013 with a fair wind. Okay, this is where technology fails us here at the moment. I just have to uh, say thank you and then go and show you a video. While you're thinking of a question, I have one for you, Ian. Would you be able to uh, tell us uh, in terms of uh, a sense of the numbers of people in the, in the community that your mine is in, how many of them would be uh, benefiting from this, uh, from this project of yours by way of uh, you know, improvement through the, through the social development management program? Um, in terms of families or, or individuals? Yeah. Um, I think there's about 2,000 people in the Barangay of Run Rano uh, in total. Uh, it, is, it is a little bit flexible because you've got illegal mining or mining activities. Hard as a mining, so we do have two groups there. One are the people that we'd call Barangay Run Rano residents, others who are inverted commas opportunists. Um, we're looking to employ 450, 500 people in, in operations or so. Um, within reason, that, that will give most of the able bodied men and a lot of the able bodied women in the valley the opportunity to work. Um, so we found that during our exploration stage um, that we actually couldn't get sufficient labour out of the out of the barangay, and so basically we moved back down the road to to uh, Solano. Thank you, Ian. A any any questions from the floor? Yeah, over uh, on your right here, Leo. Further right, okay. all the way to the right, near the cheese platter. Please stand and give your name <coughs> and affiliation. Uh, Johan Ratsma with uh, Crazy Yours. E it's an easy one, Ian. I think. Uh, I'm familiar, uh, two parts, I'm familiar with the FTA process, but uh, do you still have to, unlike on the surface rights and water rights, still have to have a separate 60-40 company? How does that work? Yeah, uh, and then, and the second part of my question is, uh, you, you mentioned a lot of permits, but do these uh, biox bacteria, they, do they need work visas? <laughs> it's actually interesting, the, the bugs, I'll answer the rest of the question in a minute, but the bugs is a... It was something I didn't like. Traditionally, um, you know, I, was a, I was a pressure oxidation guy, having worked in Porger and various other places. Didn't like bugs, because um, they had a checkered history in their early days. But once you get to understand how it works, it's, it's really interesting. And so the bugs that we actually grew, they adapt to your ores. So you do get a very specific strain to your ores. So we've got these guys sleeping in South Africa and Joburg at the moment in, in freezers, kind of waiting to be relocated to, uh, to run run out. And um, pretty early in the process, we actually get them over and we, we adapt them. We wake them up, start to build them up so that by the time uh, we put the ore in, they're pretty hungry and ready to work. Um, yes, you're right. Um, you're very clearly in real property assets, water rights and whatever, we have to absorb the 60-40 rule, which is a bit of, a, is a, bit of a, an enigma. It's a, it's a bit of a 
disconnect in the law because effectively under the FTAA, once you get it, all the land is declared mining lands and you've got all these rights granted to you under the FTAA but you can't actually own it. So you do have to put a structure in place. Um, first of all, Ian, uh, great talk. We're all very keen to see this project go ahead, um, particularly that it's uh, so close to the to Dipio project. Um, interesting that you've gone down the path of, um, of biops. Uh, the con itself, uh, will that be an arsenic-rich con? No. One of the um, one of the interesting enigmas with this ore body, and uh, when when Gary first showed it to me, I thought he was joking and asked where the gold really was. It is it is the most boring ore body I've ever seen, and that's reflected in the um, uh, kind of associated mineralogy. Um, we don't get the antimonies, the arsenics, the mercuries, the lead, zinc that you normally would associate with a inverted commas, epithermal style gold, whether it's epithermal or not, jury's out, it's probably meso, it's higher temperature. Um, you know, for me to say there is no, uh, no um, arsenic would be wrong, there is some, but it's very, very low levels. And uh, because of the process, because not only biox is biological, but it's also a ferrospheric leach, we're getting pretty, pretty down in it at the moment. But when you actually neutralise it, you call, create ferroarsenate or, or scorodite, which is extraordinarily stable. It's the most stable arsenic compound in nature. It occurs at the surface. So the little bit, the smidgen of arsenic we get actually uh, locks up a scorodote. And that is the only negative, or only other product apart from molybdenum. But assuming that in, uh, say, first quarter of uh, 2012, we have the approval of the DMF, what is your estimate of, uh, are you smiling, is that it? 2012, assuming. I'm just being very generous, aren't I? Uh, okay, well, December. Very tough. <laughs> oh, tough. Okay. But anyway, assuming that it's all uh, approved by 2012, when do you estimate uh, you will start spending on construction? And how long will that process take? We're, we're looking at starting a form of construction, what we call pre-sanctioned construction, spending real money on the ground um, in Q3 this year. This year. Clearly, the contingency there, the only contingency on that today is issue of the DMF. Um, there is nothing left for us to do on the DMF. All the plans have been ticked off, the boxes have been done, and I know where the, the study is today. It is, it is you know, basically in the director's office. So um, if it's um, 2012, to be frank, it sends a very bad message. So uh, I think that would be a very, very, very disappointing outcome. Um, I don't for one minute believe it will be. I think it's a lot more imminent than that. Well, that, that's a good message that we really needed this, this year. Any other question from the, the audience? I could probably take uh, one more before we wrap this up. Just to keep it going, Ian. <laughs> um, what would the grade of the concentrate be? What would be the uh, gold grade of the con okay. once you produce okay. that? And, um, uh, does that dictate why you're going down the path of biex rather than uh, selling a con? Oh, yeah. Um, Mike, selling a con is, is a joke. I built one of those. Um, and it worked, but it's a dreadful, dreadful game. Uh, your logistics are really tough. It's hard. You had costs. You're at the smelter's behest. Um, it is a tough game. Um, the... And the second part of the answer is, yeah, you wouldn't get what I'd consider a saleable grade. Uh, and it's always a trade-off between recovery and grade of con. Um, in a biox, you actually don't make a gold grade, you may make a sulphur grade. The bugs don't give a damn about the gold that just happens to be a byproduct. They actually want sulphur. So we've got a fairly, fairly um, tight window between about 14 and 20% or sulphur grade into, into, the, into the bug plant. That's where we've designed it. That's the scoping, the heat exchangers, the coolers and all the other, other dynamics that happen in the tank. The absolute gold grade, I can't answer, and I'm not trying to hedge it. The issue is that in, in a lab when we do our gravity test, we pull out about 55% of the gold into the gravity trap. Uh, experience would tell us that in an operating plant, you won't achieve anywhere near that, so we design at allowing for about 30% uh, recovery into the gravity trap. What we actually achieve will only be determined during operations. Clearly, if you don't get it in gravity, you get it in, in the con grade. 
So the Congrade, effectively, you've got a, you, you know you've got a um, what, what is it, a 12 percent, 13 percent upgrade. So you know if you've got no gold recovery, you're looking uh, sorry, no gravity, you're looking at 20, 25, 26 grams. You're getting gravity recovery. It could be 15 or less. Could be down as low as 12 if you get everything in gravity. On that note, uh, unless there's any other, oh, the ambassador. Yes, a microphone please for the ambassador. When I was ambassador to Australia, that's when the Mining Act was uh, passed. We had a very exciting time promoting mining to uh, very responsive, uh, excited uh, Australian companies. That was 1995, 96. Uh, in a few days, we will send a new ambassador. What do you think will her message be if you look back at your experience in the uh, presentation that you have had today? And uh, I would like to introduce her to you sometime because uh, I think this is uh, an industry that we can work very well with if we know exactly how we are going to move ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Certainly that's a curveball, but anyway, I'll have a go at it. Um, look, uh, let me stress that uh, while I speak with an Australian accent, I'm an English company. So uh, my shareholders, my support is coming out of, out of London or out of great, greater out of England. So let, let's identify that. Also, I speak with an Australian accent, but I, ha I happen to think Australians are very parochial uh, in respect to developing countries. They have love-hate love affairs with them, and I won't go any further than that with it. Um, I've had a, an association uh, in one form or another with the Philippines on and off since um, my first visit was in 85, which is a fairly interesting period of, of Philippines history. Um, and, uh, and that's varied from actually doing some work here to actually using a lot of Philippine labour in other projects, mining projects in the world. Um, I actually think that the, the Philippine mining industry, if managed properly, is on the cusp of a very exciting period of time. Um, it's a message I think other people have given. It, it is something could go either way. A few incorrect decisions, a few wrong policy decisions could actually stymie the industry. A few correct policy decisions, a few positive actions, uh, demonstration that someone like us can actually get permitting in a realistic period of time and we can get the support we need and I think people will be knocking down your door. You know, you've got one of the best, best addresses in, uh, in geology in the world. Uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of potential here. There's, you know, the kind of crazy horse boys are busy, not just to name a few. There's a lot of people here working very hard. You know, I think it's in your own making. Uh, I think, from my perspective, words are great. Demonstration of actions are better. So I think it's time for a few things to happen on the ground. Then you don't have to go tell people. You know, the industry watches. You know, the industry always listens, absolutely, but they watch more. So if they see things happening, they'll be here. If they see things not happening, they'll take their expiration dollars and go somewhere where there's a more favourable uh, environment. It's not necessary to legislation. Legislation can be the most wonderful stuff in the world, but if you don't enact it, if you don't enable it, if you don't use it, you may as well not have it. 